Let's talk to you, Jeff Tack. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. I, 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 I know a little bit about Wall Street and what you've been doing. Not a lot of people do what you do. All right. So, so I think I'm excited to have you because you've seen the world of big dollars and cents and you're also seeing the world of smaller dollars and cents. Um, so it's, it's cool to, it's cool to talk to you. So let's just quickly run through some of the stuff you did. Um, so you were at AB and AMRO for and, over a decade. And nobody in America knows what that bank is. Big right. Dutch bank, trillion dollar bank, top three or four largest bank in all of Europe. Nobody knew what it was because right. they, they didn't advertise in the United States. And your job was um, to help manage billions of dollars in that bank. So I presume these are a lot of these are deposits, presumably, or whatever cash that the bank has. So it's a combination of a bunch of things. It is deposits come in. It is borrowed money. It, it's essentially repo to funds. Cash has come in the door. You know, at the end of the day, what are banks in the business doing? They're in the business making money. So banks have a couple different ways they can make money. Easiest way the bank makes money is they just make commercial loans. So they borrow money from uh, depositors. Right now, you're getting that big 0% interest on your savings account. Yep. They take, they that take our deposits. That's right. They take those deposits. They loan them to businesses, not very many individuals, mostly businesses. Right. And they essentially make the spread between what they, the business pays them and the zero they're paying So people. if the business pays them 6 or 7% interest rate... And the depositors are getting paid zero. They're covering. They're taking all that money. Absolutely. Right. Now it gets better than this. So the bank doesn't just have to take your deposit dollars. They can also go to the Federal Reserve and borrow money. Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. So in this case, the part you were may have been working with Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago. So ab- absolutely. So what you can do is you can also borrow money from places like the Fed. You can borrow that cash and you can put it to work. And it might not be zero, but it's still pretty low. Yeah, it's still pretty low. They're not paying as little as they have. We need to open up a bank, Jeff. A, a people bank's been around for a long time, and banks always make money. Yep. So the fact is, you borrow the money, and then what you want to do is you want to do something with it. So one of the things that ABN Amro did was they actually invested in securitized products. Now, what's a securitized product? That people want to know what that is. Mm-hmm. What happens is when people take out a mortgage, mm-hmm. now this is not 1920s Bedford Savings and Loan anymore. Mm-hmm. When you actually borrow money to buy a house, what happens is that loan you made, the bank or the mortgage company, they sell it to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, who puts a wrapper on it and sells it to an investor. Mm. So what happens is the bank, and the reason why the bank Did wants to- Did you get that part, Tito? Yeah, I saw that movie, uh, The Big Short. Okay. Excellent. There you go. <laughs> All right. I don't look like uh, Robbie whatever her name is. So anyway, <laughs> she looked much better in that film. Yeah. So what happens is, so the bank takes, and then the bank gets the money from the Fed, and they go make another loan to another person. And what happens is investors buy those pools of mortgages. Mm-hmm. And what they're doing is they buy it with the goal of making money. So what we did is- I'm not going to give people all the alchemy because there's a lot of alchemy that sure. goes on. I don't want to uh, confuse anybody with what's happening. But essentially what we're doing is you're investing that cash in another product. Mm-hmm. You were taking out the risks that you Which don't cash? Take. The cash from the Fed that you the borrowed? Th- cash from the Fed that's borrowed. Mm-hmm. Goes and buys mortgages. Yeah. So support- which, which basically is k- taking cash from the Fed and then lending it to people to buy a, to house. Buy a house. Absolutely. Got it. And that makes... That makes it so buying a house is affordable. It makes right. it so the interest rates are cheap. Right. Shout out right now. If you want to get a mortgage loan, 3.5%. Damn. That's great. Lowest level since 06. Refi that. Crazy. Shit. Absolutely. If you, don't have, if you haven't refied, you want to buy. This is the time. This is it. So if you look at all that, what this does is it keeps the mechanics of housing going. Right now, there are $10 trillion in mortgage loans in America. $10 trillion. $10 trillion. Do you think there's any other country on the planet where it's that easy to get a loan for a, a, a half a million dollar house or a $400,000 house? It, it, there is no other country nah. it's easy to get that kind of loan for nope. 30 years. Other country, it's easy to get a loan. So like in Europe, first of all, all their loans are floating rate. So you don't get fixed for 30 years. Oh, you don't get your 25 or 3.5% nope. rate? No, every year you get a new rate. That's whatever. Just keeps floating. Just keeps floating. Well, that, that sucks. Means, yeah, you got to figure out what you got to pay every year. That's terrible. And the other thing that happens is every 10 years or so, you got to go back to the bank and ask them to do it again. Refi. It, it's essentially a forced refi. Damn. So, whereas here in States, you can get a 30 year loan. Wow. Well, only con- a couple countries, Denmark does yeah, too. Rate. But we're the only place really offers a 30 year fixed rate loan. Mm-hmm. And so, what you want to do is you want to have a market that is conducive to that. You know, and you got the big investment management shops like PIMCO. 
you know, they own six, seven hundred billion dollars in mortgage debt. Hmm. You know, they are some of the biggest places. And and you wonder where that money comes from. That money doesn't come from the Federal Reserve. That money comes from people's pensions. Right. Mm, right. So a lot of that money is... Which you had nothing to do with. You didn't do anything in pensions. Didn't do what anything you pensions. were doing was taking some of those deposits yep. and taking some of the money ABN or LaSalle would borrow from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago and you would invest that. Correct. You would oversee a portfolio. So the size of the portfolio you were managing at, at LaSalle... So, what was that size? So there's a lot, lots of different ways you want to look at it when you go back in time. So the, the portfolio of LaSalle time is about $40 billion. $40 billion. So my corner of the sky was about $25 billion in cash, if you want to think of it. There's all sorts of different measures to think about how you want to look at it and how you, how you measure it. But if you just want to think about the kind of, kind of long side cash sure. is... $25 billion. Wow. And so you'd, 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 you'd have $25 billion to go out and buy or, or invest in or effectively lend that $25 billion to people to, to borrow uh, and, and, and buy a home. That's right. Okay. Uh, wow. So you And for any given transaction, you wake up in the morning on a Thursday morning and you're like, okay, let me see what's on my mm-hmm. desk today. I got to go invest some cash. What's the average like transaction you do? Oh, typical typical ticket size, and this this is how people who are in the know like talk about mm-hmm. it. Typical ticket size is about a half a yard, which is about a half a billion dollars. So five hundred million, five hundred million dollars on million a dollars. given morning. Just pick up the phone and do it. And you talk directly to a bank. Yeah. So what happened is people like people like Amr here. Uh-huh. Yeah. He used to work at other banks. So what there, there's there's what's happened is there's an entire entire I'd sell infrastructure him a stash. Mm-hmm. infrastructure. So at the top, so at the top of the food chain, if you mm-hmm. want to think about it, are the brokers' brokers. Mm-hmm. Those are the people like Cantor Fitzgerald. Now yeah, those, he's not going to get any of this. What's an analogy yeah. we can think about for for them to understand? You think? Oh, oh drug dealing. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a good one. Drug. De- it's, it, <laughs> Wall Street is set up the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I like where it's going. <laughs> All right, <laughs> for real. Like you know, how there's a dealer. That's yeah. the dude you interface with. Yeah, but he's there's got someone a, way above yeah, yeah, him. Yeah, he's got he, the, he's got somebody up the food chain. And the thing that's nice about those dealers, those dealers make about ten billion dollars a year. Wait, wait, Wall Street dealers? No, no, I'm just drug talking, dealers. No, no, I'm just talking about the I'm just talking about the guys, the, the face, the face guys. No, the guys face customer facing guys. No, no, I'm talking about the dudes no, this is, who the this other is, banks just talk to at the top of the food chain. Oh, Use the customer okay. never even this is see what, these. Yeah, yeah, Where yeah, is yeah. this dealer, the guy you buy your shit from? Yeah, yeah. Where does he get it from? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. dude. What's yeah. is there a name for that dude? Uh, the, re, the source. It's kind of, yeah, the plug. The plug. So we're talking about the plug. They make billions of dollars. They make billions of dollars. And the best part is, not only do they make billions of dollars, back in the day, someone was saying that they literally, client entertainment, half a billion dollars. Kleiner Entertainment? That's right. What's that? That's the point where you take your buddy yeah. out to a strip club. Client Entertainment. Oh, Client, client entertainment. entertainment. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. That's when we go to Vegas and, and yeah. bring your money. That's right. And That's maybe right. marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you got all the banks. You got all the banks like JP Morgan. You got banks like Deutsche Bank, you know, international known. And those guys are basically serving as facilitators, helping to move the cash from point A to point B. Right. And then the kind of the bottom is you got the end investors who are essentially buying the bonds That's from you. them. And that was You're me. the end investor. Correct. And you do five hundred million on an average transaction. Yes. Damn. I don't know how you and and and, and wouldn't I mean it's gotta be a thrill to basically move that kind of, I mean I remember doing some trans, large transactions myself and dude, I would like be pissing my pants in the seat. Maybe because I was in my twenties, but I'd be like, Oh shit, I don't want this to blow up in my face. These are just numbers in a computer. Pretty Come much, on now, man. I mean, just, it's just, just add some zeros. Make, you make a mistake; it costs one or two million dollars. It's your your job is you're gone. Really? Oh hell yeah! Oh. I I made a mistake once where it cost a quarter million dollars to the bank. Ooh. Thank God they didn't fire me. But yeah. have you ever had a situation where you were forced to lose? Actually, before we started, you were talking about a two million dollar situation. No, no. It, it, look, it's just one of these things where there's there's different ways to do transactions. So you can do transactions that move the market. Right. So you want to just roll in and you want to make a wave. Mm. Well, you roll in, you make a wave. You make those kind of transactions. Those cost money because those are some of the ripple effects. You're yeah. saying that uh, if someone wanted to go and buy all the, for example, marijuana on every street corner everywhere, suddenly the price of marijuana is going to go up because you're buying it all. Supply and demand. Do you get that? Mm-hmm. So you're saying if you want to go in and buy all these mortgage loans, you're going to create that kind of wave and all the price is going to go up. Correct. Okay, I got you. And so what you want to do is you want to be subtle about it. And the, and, and the fact is, if you look at the U.S. mortgage market, the U.S. mortgage market is the largest, most liquid market on this earth. 
So if you want to think about this. More liquid than some of the big stock markets? More liquid than stock markets, more liquid than the treasury markets. If you think about this, in a U.S. mortgage market, you... Oh, do you know what liquid means? I mean, you could get cash out of it. Yeah, it's easy to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy yeah. to yeah. transact it. Easy to buy easy I, I have a house, I don't have money, so the house have money. Right? What? If I have a house, I need money. I can sell the house, and now I have money. That's liquidity. All right. right. And a house, it takes 30, 60, 90 days, right? Mm -hmm. In the mortgage market, you can do shit in seconds. Ooh. You can could, could buy and sell loans in seconds. And, oh, and, and if you think about it, you go want to go and buy and sell a house. Mm -hmm. Well, you go and buy and sell a house, you got to pay the broker 6%. You got to pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. You pay with all this stuff. It costs you 8, 9, 10% right. of the value of the house crazy. to sell it from one person to another. To another. Crazy. If you want to trade these products, it costs you one cent on $100. Uh, crazy, isn't it? I can't stand that. That's the one thing I like about America is buying and selling a house is just so damn expensive. Ten percent, crazy expensive. So okay. Yeah. So tell me about a story where you were saying uh, where you were like you know you were you were forced or you know you lost a big chunk of money or no no. It's, it's, it, look, here's the thing. You got to remember when you're dealing with these big numbers. There's lots of times where you lose a lot of money. Right. July of 2003, dropped 42 million dollars in a month. Who did? I did. No shit. Sometimes that and you were work. you also the portfolio like you were the senior yeah. portfolio manager on this? I was the person picking up the phone, making buying and selling. Did you lose your job? No. Damn. It's just money. Because going into the month I was up eighty four million dollars. Right. <laughs> so you're like, well, that was a bad month. Yeah. <laughs> Don't like that. Don't do it again. Damn. You when know. you say lose. Yeah. Where does it go? Well what happens is it it it, it <laughs> it's a good question. Man, what are you talking about? <laughs> lose. Well, well, it, it's the same thing if you buy a stock. Right. So if you you buy you buy a stock. Right. You buy $10. some overstock. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <it's> overstock. <laughs> yeah, that's twenty five. So you bought ten thousand dollars overstock yesterday. Yeah. Today, that's only seven thousand dollars. You lost three. So you just lost three percent. Now here's the thing: if you don't cash in and it goes back up, you didn't really lose money. Right. Yeah. Okay, but if you need the money today. You just lost three grand. You just ah, lost three grand. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like you know yeah, when the yeah, yeah, uh, when the stock, when the housing market went down yeah. and everyone's house value went down. Mm -hmm. Technically, you lost money. Yeah. Your house is no longer worth three hundred grand; it's worth two hundred grand. But if you wait it out, it's going to go back up. back up. So in that month, when he priced his books, it showed uh, down forty two million. Yeah, yeah, all right. You know, and so the thing is, yeah, there's there's losses you realize, losses you don't realize, but you look down, you're like, oh, that was a bad month. Right. Try not to do that again. All right. So there was a story you were telling me about sure. where you were asked to, uh, someone asked you to do a transaction. Yeah. And it was a very, very large, like what, how many billion dollars? Yeah, $3 billion. $3 billion transaction. And for you, you would have been more subtle. You would have been like, yo, let me do a little today. Let me do a little tonight. Let me do a little tomorrow. And I'll get it, I'll get it through at a better price. You just want to work it quietly. But you want to work it quietly. But here's the thing. If, if you want something real fast right now, when you call up DoorDash mm -hmm. and you want it now... You pay the fee. Yeah. Right. Whereas if you just walk down the street to McDonald's and you buy your Big Mac, yeah. no delivery fee. Right. There you go. It's the same difference. You had to pay a big ass delivery you fee. You gotta pay a big delivery fee. So on three billion you want it now. So on three billion transactions, they wanted it right now. Right now. Snap, snap. And that costed you what more than you what you would have spent. That cost about two million dollars. Extra two million dollars. Now here's I would have taken that two million dollars, man. Damn. Look, it's it's like you know, it's like like now I gotta pay some guy some guy at some big bank two million dollars. That, that is what DoorDash is mm -hmm. in the world right. of high finance. Right. Okay. Your, your, your six ninety five delivery fee, that's yeah, $2 million in the world of high finance. <laughs> exactly. So what you got to think about is just you got to think about when you're setting the transaction up, you know, how are you going to source it? How are you going to get it done? Where are you going to pay the least prices? And it's just like everything else. You call around. You see what you can work. You see where you get the best price. And then you do the transaction. It is, it is no different then if you walk to Best Buy, you look at the price line and you plot your phone and look on Amazon yeah. and you're like, it's cheaper there. Right. I'm buying it there. Good analogy. Hell yeah. I do that shit all the time. I'll be standing in Best Buy and be like, let me check the shit on Amazon. I just use the scanner. This little the oh, Savvy the QR Shopper. Code? The QR code? Yeah. Well, the app I use is Savvy Shopper. You just scan the QR, uh, the it's barcode. The, the UPC. And then it just comes up with all the prices online. Oh, and snap. That's Local good. stores and then you can just find out where it's cheapest. Damn. It's it, look. It's no. It's no different. You call around. You find the cheapest price, and you get it done. Same thing, right? Same okay. Thing. All right. So you were managing twenty plus billion dollar portfolio, helping that portfolio return money. You were hoping it would make two one billion, two billion each year, something like that. And that was your job year after year was to make make billions of dollars on this on this LaSalle Bank slash ABN portfolio. That was the entire job. 
Damn. And you know, it's it's one of those things where you know, how do you people, not steal a billion G? How do you not? How do you <laughs> not stash, sit there? Just stash right? it. Like if I was serving fries at a McDonald's, I'd be sneaking a fry in. <laughs> you know, I'd be Were you able to sneak any fries in? Jeff? You sneak any no fries? fries? Come on, boss. Look, man. Talk all this money. You, you, hey, <laughs> hey, it wasn't for lack of trying, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you tried yeah. to figure that shit out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone's got to think through. Like, all right, if I wanted to do this, how would I find? How would I steal this shit and then disappear? Dude, I'd be gone. I'd be like that McAfee dude. Oh yeah, that dude. Yeah, so, <laughs> buy an island, get the hell out of here. Okay, but, God, but, you don't. You don't have to. You can answer politically yeah. correct, but I don't care what you say, man. I know you thought about it. But here's the thing: you guys, you guys, <laughs> yeah, right? you guys yeah, yeah, keep yeah. talking about stealing fries. The fact is, what you guys are forgetting <laughs> is there's so many easier ways just to make the money. Oh yeah, Cause do here's, tell. Because here's the thing: you talk. Our you, listeners are listening. I, look, <laughs> what it comes down to it is at the end of the day, it's about working hard and getting paid. Word. And for all the people who are looking for a shortcut, right, who are looking sketchy. to steal right. the fry, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. the fact is we've got lots of people in jail that's trying to steal the French fries. Yeah. And here's mm-hmm. the nice part. If you, if you steal like millions and millions of dollars, you don't go to jail. You only go to jail if you steal French fries. Yes. Isn't that crazy? This is true. It is. This is true. You Bullshit, steal, steal big. Bullshit. Yeah, right. Steal big. Look, look you, you steal a $5,000 car or you steal a Ferrari, it's Grand Theft Auto in both cases, and you're going to wait for five to ten. Five to ten years. That's right. Now, okay. if you kill somebody in Chicago, well, you only get like three years. But you know Is what? That right? Oh yeah. Look at the, look at the guy who uh, who got who uh, what was the, what was the cop's name who got? Oh uh, yeah, Laquan McDonald. Yeah, Laquan McDonald. Yeah, I forget you know? the cop's name now. Yeah. He, he got he got what? Eighty four months in jail. Yeah, seven. If, years. if he had stolen a car, he would have been in jail longer. Longer. Jeez, that's fucked up. We got too many motherfuckers on this planet, so I understand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, so, all right. Wait. The whole point was, <laughs> wait. You just made a case for. Yeah, I should have stolen some money because yeah. I would have went to jail less. No, you should work hard. Yeah, and, and yeah that's the point. How, how it works, and then Play it's the not as. Play yeah. the game. All right. You should have stole more money. The more money you steal, the less time you go to jail. Exactly. So just take all of it. Take all. Take all of it. Yeah. Take all of it. Everything <laughs> like, you can grab. No, it's not that easy. I mean, just like, it's my billion. mentality going into Target. Look, look, <laughs> look, just, look. You might as well go the big. bigger thing. Yeah. Look, in in all seriousness, the the whole point of this is, is not about stealing for yourself. No. Nah. The whole point of this is you got to understand the goal is to make money mm-hmm. because all those people who are employed in that organization, all the people who sit in the finance department, you see the bank tellers behind the window. Those people have got jobs so they can pay right. for their families. Right. Yep. They need and, Jeff Tech to be making a billion dollars a year. And what you got to be doing is you got to be making the money to help make sure all those people get paid their I salaries. I like this guy, man. What a good yeah. dude, man. And Think about get, your local money. And right. people get taken care of. It's like Dwayne's, uh, this comedy community, uh, just think positive. Be positive. <laughs> yeah. Hot boy summer, baby. But hot boy summer. Good. Thank you, Jeff. All right. So that's a great point. So um, now you then, after after ABN, you then had experiences at Credit Agricole in their hedge fund business. Uh, helping oversee a $34 billion portfolio. And then you worked at a company called Crestline, which is a fund of funds company, helping oversee a $10 billion portfolio. Correct. Okay. I assume similar roles. You were a fixed income expert helping helping manage and, and invest some of that money. Yeah. So it's just one of those things where the expertise is in fixed income and in markets. Right. And what people, what people think, as big as the stock market is, fixed income markets are way bigger. Right. Mm-hmm. Because we in this country love like to, to borrow, borrow money. money. Hell yeah, baby. We love to borrow that shit. Now, people. Student buy- loans, credit card loans, mortgage loans, other car people's loans, money, baby. OPM. We love other people's money. Yeah. Because we got a billion and a half in student loans, or a trillion and a half in student loans, $10 trillion in mortgage, trillion and a half in credit cards. Yeah, trillions of dollars in autos. If you think about all these things, just the consumer does, and that is before you get to corporations, mm-hmm. which borrow another $4 trillion. And that is before you get to the big kahuna of the mall, the U.S. government, which is borrowing $22 trillion. So huge ass deficit. So if you look at this country, you look at this country, debt really quickly adds up to be about $60, 70000000000000 trillion. Ooh. Damn. And that, and, and these That's are- That's way bigger than the stock market. Way bigger than the stock market. Dang. And if you think about all that debt- is there are high quality borrowers, which people call investment grade, and seven eight hundred credit scores. Seven eight hundred credit scores. Those are those are high FICO borrowers. Then you got a lot of people who are the subprime. 
So you got those wonderful people who less those 620 FICO scores and lower. You know nothing about that, do you, Tito? I do. Mine's is a 680, baby. Oh, that's not bad. 680. I think the best part was 2000. 680's not subprime, is it? Uh, 680 is it's kind of near prime. Medium. Good. Prime. prime. I'm not, I'm good. He's yeah. good. I'm, uh, yeah, John, I'm do, you know your, do you know your credit score? Uh, last time I checked, it was like 660, but uh, some hospital bills went to collection, so it's oh, probably snap. probably way lower. Uh, it's 420. It yeah. <laughs> 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 There's a lot of debt, man. That's a, that's not a it is nothing a to sneeze at. A lot but, of people buy a lot of money. It's not good, right? Well, I mean, it just makes you work harder because you got to pay that shit back. Well, remember what it's, I talked about before, and it's good debt and there's bad debt. Right. So if you got to buy a car to go to work, so you can earn some money, and you get that's a good car debt. loan, that's good debt. Because right. if you didn't have a car, you wouldn't have a job. Right. But if you buy or the money on your mm-hmm. credit card because you just want some more bling, right? And you're sitting there paying. 12, 13, 20, 25 percent interest, that's bad debt. Right. Because it's expensive and you've been better off just trying to save your money and buy it. But we here in America, we don't like to save. Nah. We like our stuff yeah. now. Give me my shit now. All right. So uh of of all these three big experiences, yeah. right? Uh uh, does anything jump out at you like a story or an experience in that 15, 20 year stretch? that has really kind of like stuck out in your mind as like a story you repeat a lot to people or like, it's like, damn, that day you went home in the days, you're like, holy shit. Uh, something like that. Well, here's the thing. Big loss, big gain, something like that. Actually, when people talk about this, it's the same reason in Hollywood why movies about money usually suck. Mm. Uh, because people don't care about money. They want a crime drama. Yeah. They want something real. Concrete. They want something they can experience. You know. All right, tell us about the time somebody died on your trading floor. Yeah, nobody ever died on my trading <laughs> floor. Um, yeah, people want things that are real and legit. When you talk about moving money around, it's just a bunch of dudes sitting at computer screens typing at keyboards. <laughs> and if they seriously put a movie of that going on all day yeah, long, that'd be good. nobody go to see that. No, You're like, no. bunch of dude at a keyboard again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that dude gave him a high five. Wow, that was exciting. It'd be like watching the <laughs> golf channel. Yeah. Oh, gee, George, he just made a good trade. Everyone give him a subtle applause in the gallery. Well done. Now let's turn it to 18 and see what's going on there. No, I mean, look, what it is... Tiger is having sex on the whole. What's going on there? But no, no, what it is is the stories are uh, that are just hilarious. You know, you want to talk about the story. I can remember when I was 23 years old, I brought this up to somebody the other day. I was, I, was talk, I was interviewing a job at the Board of Trade back when they actually had a Board of Trade. Now it's just a studio lot. Um, and you go in, the guy actually made me stand on a chair and yell. Hmm. Why is that? He wanted to make sure like, my voice would carry mm-hmm. and people could hear me. Damn. So when was the last time you actually went to an interview and guys like, hey, dude, get on the chair, stand up, start yelling at me. Mm. Louder, louder, louder. Okay, that's fine. Sit down. That reminds me of my, I was at Solomon Brothers before they uh, mm-hmm. merged, before their city. And uh, I, this is an investment bank. And they're kind of like rough and rowdy type of people there. Sure. In my interview, they made me stand up pull up my pants to check if I was wearing white socks or black socks. And they said, if you were wearing white socks, we're not going to hire you. But because you're wearing black socks with your dress pants, we're going to hire you. What if you're like a Michael Jackson fan? <laughs> they would what not hire you're me. You're like, yo, I got a fucking <laughs> Billie Jean audition after this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of some of the crazy shit they do uh, that's crazy. in these finance companies. Yeah, because everyone, I don't know, man. I don't know anything Mike. about that world. I I'm, I don't know anything about that world. I just seen Wolf of Wall Street, yeah. and I could imagine making money like that would make everybody like hype as shit. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me put it this. Did they ever way. throw you on a bullseye? Throw a midget on a bullseye. Midget on a bullseye. A small person. <laughs> yeah, they know it's small. Okay, again, you come back around. Just, they ain't no small people on a bullseye at the office. All right, that I know what your office is like, but we're dude. They were throwing me all the time. Man. <laughs> if I made a billion dollars, I'm throwing some motherfucking midgets on a wall, G. Nobody is putting no midgets on their walls. Velcro midgets. <laughs> yeah, but there's that shit. You get the big dartboard, the Malcolm midget. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Look. People got in trouble for that crap. If you go back to like 03, Jeffrey's got in trouble with the SEC because mm-hmm. they were busy flying people around on planes, coking up the people, and they always had a midget around because like the guy said, sometimes you just want a midget. 
So yeah, great. that crazy stuff happens. But for the most part, if you look at all these offices, mm-hmm. people think these jobs are fun, exciting. What they are is long, they're boring, and they are stressful. Yeah. That's why you need to do some crazy shit sometimes. I think so. And, and so, yeah, some people do some crazy shit, some people do not, whatever. It's just, it's all part of people's personalities. Yeah. And if you think about this, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, they think that these things are big dollars running around, so on and so forth. It's just dudes sitting at computer screens. Yep. All right. So, uh, so you now, you now have since left a lot of that uh, bigger yeah. multi-billion dollar management and you're, you're not doing that day to day right now. Is that yeah. correct? So what I, what I have done is I, I become a bit of a serial entrepreneur. Serial hey. entrepreneur. No, we are. What's what, up? Yeah. What we've done is, is we have taken advantage of the great opportunity that other people call the great recession. Mm-hmm. So you saw it as a great opportunity. I saw it as a great opportunity. This is back in 2008, 2009, 2010. 2006, 2007. Oh. People saw the housing crisis. I was going to say the housing crisis. Housing crisis was, was, people were talking about this in 2005. Right. So back in 2005, companies were writing loans, which they called ninja loans. Right. What's a ninja No loan? income. No income, no asset, no job. Yeah. So I have a question. If you're going to lend some money to somebody who's got no income, got no assets, and got no job, how do you think they're going to pay you back? Mm-hmm. Hell no. So if you look back in time, we were building about... In Monopoly money. That's how they pay exactly. you back. So we were building about 2.2 million houses in America. We we're only creating 1.3 million new households a year. Actually, at the time, 1.1 million. Mm-hmm. So we were literally building a million houses more a year that people were just buying up to flip back and forth to other people. So you had way too many houses. Mm-hmm. So what happened is you had the Great Recession and you had all these extra houses, some abandoned, some not, all the prices collapsed. Mm-hmm. So if you go, our business is located in southeastern Michigan. Um, we actually are in a single What is the name of your business? Uh, Woodward Real Estate Partners. Woodward Real Estate Partners. And Woodward is essentially the, southeast the road. Southeast Michigan. Southeast Michigan. It runs from Detroit out to Pontiac. It's a major thoroughfare. Um, very well known, very popular um, for a stretch of highway. And one of the things that happened is prices in that area, because it was Detroit, Mm -hmm. collapsed so much. Detroit had a higher level of unemployment in the Great Recession than they did during the Great Depression. Damn. Fewer people working. Do you remember what that number was? Yeah, it was 26.5%. Damn. Back in the Great Depression, it was only like 24. Mm -hmm. There were more people out of work in Detroit in the Great Recession than Depression. So what happened was nobody could pay their mortgage. And in the process of nobody paying their mortgage... You could, first house we ever bought, walked in, three bedroom. You went to this house and looked at it? Yeah, absolutely. Walked in with my partner, walked in, looked at it, three bedroom, bath and a half, three car garage, new driveway. We bought it for $16,000. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to think about the context of the time, if you wanted to buy a new Camry off the lot, new Camry cost you $32,000. Yeah, you were buying a house for half, half a Camry. Half a Camry. It could seem better. If you wanted to buy a new double wide trailer. Double wide trailer. Manufactured like- house. Yeah. That cost $86,000 at the time. So you could buy a house for a sixth as much as you could buy a trailer. <laughs> yeah, it makes. And people were literally afraid. Yeah. I remember walking around, you know, if you're talking about your stories, I remember in 2011, uh, I was in New York and I was seeing these guys uh, in this family office in New York. Family offices are a bunch of rich dudes, put their money together and invest it. Um, these guys, if you remember the movie Trading Places, The Dukes, Mortimer and Randolph. Indeed. Hey, man, something tells me that they're, they're the Koch brothers. Yeah, they exactly could be the Koch brothers. <laughs> I walked in the office. These two old dudes looked just like them. And I'm looking, looking at them and I'm pitching them this idea. Mortimer. Which is buy up the property, let the market recover, sell it. Mm-hmm. Guys looked at me and said, we don't want to do that. I'm like, why don't you want to do it? We think Michigan's going away. Where's it going? <laughs> and I'm like, where's, where's it going? going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We calling up some Native American tribes, be like, hey, we want our bees <laughs> yeah, yeah. back. What's the yeah, return yeah. policy here? That shit just didn't happen. And so what we did was we put money to work when everybody's running away. And this has been a phenomenal growth opportunity because if you look at that house, that house now rents for two thousand dollars a month. Two thousand. What does that mean in value? You think hundred grand? Oh two, no, no, more than that. Oh, t- today's prices, most things are between two and three hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, this is a thing where, you know, you want to talk when you talk about to your listeners who are interested in business, interested in finance, interested in making money for themselves. You know, those opportunities don't exist anymore. 
Right. That was a one time yeah. only deal and that deal is that ship has sailed. Right. But I can say this right now. If you look at the mortgage market today, interest rates are three and a half percent, and you have not looked into buying a house, you should look into buying a house. This is the time, baby. Well, it's in the things where it's actually a little bit yeah, always the time. Because what I mean, people like to think about houses as investments. Your first house is not an investment. Your second house is an investment. Right. Your first house is about putting a roof over your head and paying principal and saving money. Right. And if you think about the ways people have gotten rich in this country, they get rich off real estate. Mm. They get rich off buying buildings. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the big, wealthy families like the Zells here in Chicago, it is about buying real estate. The Trumps. Ever heard of them? I heard of those guys. They made some money in real estate, I heard. So real estate is a way for people to make money. It's a way for Trump to make money, but it's also a way for your listeners to make money. Yeah, baby. And the point that I simply say is, is when you look at that first house, don't think about it as investment. Think of that as something you want to own. Now, a lot of people are like, you know, I don't want that house because I want mobility. I want to move. I want to move. So as a landlord in single family rentals, we have had people renting for us for seven years. Damn. Those people all got in because they thought they were going to they move. move. Seven years later, a lot of people don't move. Haven't moved, and so when you're really thinking about your excuses for being a renter and paying profit to a landlord versus owning something for yourself, the argument that I'm going to move, if you can't look on the calendar and know when you're leaving, you're probably going to be there in the future. Boom! You get that. Mm -hmm. Time to buy, fellas. So, and rates are so low. So, if you look historically, Only home prices go up about inflation plus one percent a year. Home okay. prices go up about inflation, which is two or three percent. Yep, plus another one percent. Correct. So about four percent. And if you're borrowing money at three and a half, and you're earning four, you're winning. You're winning. And so that's the thing that I would say to all your listeners: if you're sitting here and you're deciding whether you want to buy or you want to don't buy, it's always a good time to buy. To put over a roof over your head all right, and make some money out. I agree. All right. So give us, to the extent you're willing to share, sure. give us some more details about your experience. So this is, you were still at ABN yep. and you're like, yo, I'm going to start, start waving in some of these uh, $16,000 houses. Yep. How, how many were you able to buy? Oh, uh, look, I don't want to get into portfolio details. Okay. We bought a lot. Okay. And this is one of those things where this, it was, again, a once in a lifetime opportunity, right. never to be repeated again. Right. And the thing is, the, the lesson that is here for people is not that I did it and not some other people did it. The lesson to be learned here is that you want to look for those opportunities. And those kind of opportunities are not something where you're trying to hedge, like maybe I'll make a percent here, maybe I'll make a percent there. There's one of those opportunities where you stop and you look and you just say to yourself, the price is wrong. Mm. This is the opposite of Bob Barker. It's not the price is right. <laughs> the price is wrong. Yeah, when you saw 16, you're like, I'm going to start buying as many of these as I can. It's just like, just like start waving these things in. Right. Because when you look down and you realize that the price is wrong, that's an opportunity to buy. Boom. Now, isn't it, doesn't it make sense that we're probably going to see something like that again, maybe not in housing, but asset prices in general in this country, given the way we set stuff up, uh, asset prices in this country do go up and do go down. And when they go down, just like Buffett likes to say, you know, when everyone's scared, you want to be greedy. Absolutely. And you think, it's probably not going to happen to housing yet. The Great Recession is the first time that home prices went down since the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So the fact is, this is something that was pre rare occurrence. It, it's actually, it, it, home prices are going to keep going up for a while. And the reason is, I talked about before, demographics. Right. We're making it right now about 1.3 million new households per year. That's people moving out of their parents' basement. It's people getting their own pad, things like that. Right. We're only building about 900,000 houses. So that balance feels right. So, well, the fact is we're taking more people than we're building the houses. Yeah, we need more houses. So we need more houses. And so when you, well, it says this is supply and demand. Right. So prices are going to keep going up in that sector, even if we have a bit of recession, because if we have a recession, they're not going to be building more houses. Mm. What's even worse, and this is really bad for the folks who are looking for starter homes, is if you look at the houses being created, 65% of them are half a million or higher in price. No shit. Yeah. Expensive houses. Only about 10% are under a quarter million. <sighs> so for the person who's the, looking for that supply as a first-time home buyer, that person is actually fairly disadvantaged because mm. there are very few Slim houses pickets. for sale. We actually looked in, in one of the cities that we're in, 
Um, 7,000 housing units. I remember this was about May 1st. 25 houses for sale. That's it. Wow. So that's that's something where you really want to talk about supply and demand. Yeah, if anything, build some smaller condos or some smaller lower Are millennials price homes. not buying houses because of this debt we're talking about? Student loan debt? Student loan, credit cards, bad decisions. All that stuff, and yep. You're not really... You're, yeah, you're employed, but... Well, but underemployed. What really. you're saying, the numbers are 1.3 million people are getting into new houses. A lot of those are millennials, so they're probably starting to get out from under that some of that debt. I doubt it. But but here's the other thing: when, when you think about it, you know you're paying rent every month, so so that cash is going in. And the Why thing is, there are programs like sure. the FHA, Federal Housing Administration, <clears throat> has loans available for people where you only have to put three percent down. Sure. So there are ways where you don't have to put together that much cash. For an opportunity right. to put a roof over your head. Right, you can still get it. So you can still get it. You simply have to want to do it. Now, that's not true for investors, 3%. Oh, no, that's not true for investors. That is that is a government program for individuals. Right, right. You know, if you look at somebody who want to be an investor, if you really want to embark upon this route now, um, you can go to the, the big agencies. You can go to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Uh, Fannie Mae will give you a loan on up to four houses. Freddie Mac will give you a loan on up to 10. Four single family homes? Yeah, four single family homes. And How Freddie up that? to 10? Yep. Yeah, you simply fill out a loan application. Find yourself a mortgage broker, make a loan application. There's just that a, for 10 homes. Do you homes. need like, a good credit score and all that jazz? You probably need higher than your credit score. God damn it. <laughs> Maybe Shut a little up. bit. Dodler. <laughs> <laughs> you need a lot more than his credit score. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, you know, as long as you have the uh, opportunity and chance to buy the home uh, and not worry about some of these other things, I just feel like, honestly, like a lot of people my age, age range, uh, they're not making any moves. Dude, we're afraid to even have kids. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. So like you keep building houses. I don't know who's filling them. Programmers and, I mean, yeah, and nurses. Exactly. exactly. Most people are not comedians. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 95, 99% are not. You know, people as, are not. As long people as, with jobs, Tito. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not Lyft or Uber drivers. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, some of those dudes make money. Come on. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, they do. If you work the, if you work the affiliate, Right. For sure, you can make... There's six-figure drivers out there, for sure. What's what does work the affiliate mean? Work, so you get, like... Um, if you get people to sign up after, like, a certain amount of rides in a time period, you get, like, a bonus, right? So, like, I gave you a code. You use that code when you sign up. As a, drive, as a new driver? <laughs> yeah. I got you. And then you go and you give 60 rides in, a, in, oh. in 30 days or whatever. And then you and I both get $300. Damn. And Lyft, when I started, was at up to 900 Ooh. And everybody I gave my code to... Never used it. <laughs> so mad. But yeah, there's dudes that just hustle the, the right, affiliate. So you can just make money off the affiliate. Damn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So Jeff, so this portfolio you built up. So did you end up managing all these homes yourself when the toilet breaks and when the drywall's busted? <laughs> yeah. So what we've got to do is we've got a uh, property management company. For sure. So we've got people who are employed to run around and fix the toilet's breaks, you know, replace the light bulb. This was a, manage- a property management company that already existed in Michigan? No, we, we, we made it up ourselves. Oh, you kind of created yeah, it. Yeah. Me and my partner. We, we did everything from soup to nuts. You know, we, we set up that. You know, we got tired of paying the 6% broker's commission. Right. We just opened up our own brokerage. Brokerage, yeah, it makes sense. Oh, yeah. really? And, yeah, yeah. and you hired a real estate agent? No, we just made ourselves real estate agents. Yeah, oh. just pass the test. You just go take the test. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I'm a broker now. Damn. Um, but, I mean, who's got to show the house and all that stuff? Oh, look, here's the thing. What you forget is the person who's a seller, the, who's the, the broker representing the seller, they don't show the houses. They just know? put a lock they on just, the front they door? They just put a lock mm-hmm. on the door. Wait, if, if you actually walked in to buy a house, your broker's with you, nobody else shows up, guy turns the key, you walk in, you're like, yeah, I might want to do something here. Right. You never, ever see <clears throat> mm. the seller's broker right. until you get to the closing table, and they're there because they want their check. Right. That's the only reason they're there. They yeah, want so it paid. don't really matter. I got you. But you guys do have to pay that buyer's broker. We, uh, we do pay them. There's um, that 3% there. That's 3%, but we save 3% on the transactions. Yeah, which, that's huge. It adds up after time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the property yep. management. You would hire, you basically create a private management company yep. that dealt with all those problems. Correct. And then that's the seller's agent and the real estate stuff. Yep. Your own brokerage. Yeah, and then finally, we've got our own uh, essentially construction business. So if we want, so we are our own licensed general contractors. So if we want to rebuild the property, mm-hmm. we just tear it down and we put a new one up. Yeah. We pull the permits and do everything else. So, you know, this was something that we had always done by plan, which is the first stage was to simply, if you want to sell this, warehouse the product, which is you buy it, you rent it, you get positive carry, which means you're <coughs> earning money every month. So you're taking the cash in and you're waiting for prices to appreciate. Yep. Well, we've now moved to the next stage where prices have appreciated. Have appreciated, right. And so we're now looking, as we look at the portfolio, we're looking at those houses which 
we weren't afraid to buy mm-hmm. the ugliest house on the block because that house gets taken down, the 2,200 square foot McMansion gets put up in its place and it sells for a much higher price. So we actually bought a lot of homes under construction this year. And, you know, we will see what the spring selling season, the goal is to get these done. They're under construction now. We'll get them done and finished probably January and February. And then come April 1st, we go on the market there and you we go. really sell it. This is a lot more fun than, than pushing buttons on a computer, bro. Yeah, that is, hey, that is you right. You made a good move, bro. It's stressful, but it's fun, right? I'm sure, but you made the right call. I got into real estate those times because, yeah, those properties were super cheap. Right. Look, it, it's simply about making money. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, this is something which, you know, it's, and again, you talked about your listeners. Your listeners are looking for ways to make money. It is looking for an opportunity and not being afraid to jump on it. Right. And, you know, one of the things is, you know, Woody Allen famously said 80% of life is just showing up. Yep. Well, what a lot of life is, is you're showing up and you're waiting for the opportunity. And when it shows up, don't pounce. be afraid to grab it. Pounce, baby. Pounce. Take Get on it. Yeah. So that's what you did. I like that. Great, man. So uh, so that's what you So now you guys are basically mm-hmm. tearing down the ones that looked really ugly, the big Berthas, and then you're putting up new ones. Yep. And are you starting to sell off some of these homes? I mean, it sounds like April, as April 1st comes around, you're going to start selling it. Do you plan to sell the whole portfolio? Well, here's the thing. At, at some point in time, we will die. So I would we'd like to pick up before that. <laughs> but the, the fact is, in the intermediate time periods, we've actually always bought and sold houses all the time. Yep. And a lot of times, you know, unlike the stock market where there's a price and everybody sees what the price is, you really don't know what the price is on a house until you put it on the market and see what somebody pays. Yeah. So we have, even in periods where the markets were lower, we have always usually sold stuff every year mm-hmm. because that's where we see where the what, price the real, points. what the price really is. Yeah. Right. And a lot of times people are like, oh, the price is here. And you put it out there and it doesn't sell. Right. You're yeah. like, well, price ain't there. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. You know, the other thing is, and this is true both for commercial real estate as for residential real estate. So, and this is again what I talked about before, the tax code. When you sell a stock and you make some money on it, what do you got to do? Short term or long term gains tax. That's correct. When you sell real property, that's commercial buildings, single family residences, apartment buildings, how much taxes do you pay? Tito, you know this, right? <laughs> I don't know, like 30%. <laughs> I don't know. You pay nothing. Damn. Because what happens is in the tax code, there's something called a 1031 exchange. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where if you sell property and buy another property, all the money is, all the taxes are deferred until the end of the game. So if you look at all these dudes. You got to have something lined up to purchase. uh, You got time. You got got a period of time. You got basically 180 days to find something. Six months. Exactly. But all it is is work in the system. And if you're in the real estate business where you're buying and selling, that's easy. That's easy because there's always something else to be buying. Right. And the thing is, is you look at a lot of these people who've made huge amounts of money, just killing some real estate, like Donald they Trump. Yet, they have yet to pay. Never paying taxes. And there's also depreciation, of course, right? Well, you, you look, you've got other business expenses. I, I, always, I always look at depreciation. There's two kinds of depreciation. There's tax depreciation, but there's also real depreciation, which is stuff breaks in a house. Yeah. Dishwasher breaks. Right. The fridge breaks. You know, same thing with apartment building. Lights go out. You know, that's actually real depreciation, which you have to put money back into. Now, there's all sorts of games you play and how you maximize that and you kind of reduce your, your current tax bill. But I always say to people, there's both real depreciation and there's tax depreciation. Real depreciation, you got to put the money back in if you want to keep the property up. And when you put that money back in, that can be deducted from your... That's a business expense. That is also deducted. Yeah, so um, that's good. Exactly. And Along so, with... Tax depreciation also gets deducted. At the end of the day, whatever earnings you might have made from rent mm-hmm. income, you pretty much don't pay any taxes on that. Well, you can you can do that. In fact, one of the neat things about in the tax code in the U.S., if you have a business, you have to make money two of every seven years. Otherwise, the IRS tells you it's a hobby, not a business. Mm. And they disallow all your deductions and everything else for it. Real estate, only business, you can never make money and never lose the deductions. You can never you. make money. Yeah, you, they're okay with you not making any money, <clears throat> uh, but your deductions will continue to play, play for, out. Forever. Wow. Because they just assume you'll make money when you sell in the end. <sighs> so there's all sorts of different you know, benefits where you simply look at what the rules are. And much like Amazon, paying no taxes, Damn. you just pay the, play the game according to the rules. Damn. So many tax benefits in real estate. Damn. Mm-hmm. I love that. Uh, thank you, Jeff Tack. You're very that welcome. Was, that was fantastic real estate 
expertise as well as some of your uh, billion dollar management. Fantastic, man. Brought me back to my JP Morgan days. Uh, Tito, thanks for being here, brother. Anytime, boss. That was fun, man. I appreciate Thank you, boss. you coming in. And John Dolder, producing the shit out of this show. Always a pleasure. Love you, brother. Uh, <laughs> peace out, y'all. Thank you. <laughs>